Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this very special event, part of the International Literature Showcase Programme. The ILS is a partner between National Centre for Writing and British Council. My name is Chris Gribble. I'm the Chief Exec at the National Centre for Writing, and it's my pleasure to welcome our guest curator and our chair for this evening's event, Kai Miller. This evening, Kai will present his selection of 10 unmissable emerging writers from the UK, and we'll then be joined by three of the selected writers who will share and discuss their work. Kai is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, professor of creative writing, and a writer of poetry, novels, and essays. His 2014 collection, The Cartographer Tries to Map a Way to Zion, won the Forward Prize for Best Collection, while his 2017 novel, August Town, won the Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature, the Prix des Afriques, and the Prix Cabé de la Caraïbe et du Tout Monde. In 2010, the Institute of Jamaica awarded him the Silver Musgrave Medal for his contributions to literature, and in 2018, he was awarded the Anthony Sabga Medal for Arts and Letters. His most recent poetry collection, In Nearby Bushes, was published by Carcanet Press in 2019, and his most recent collection of essays, Things I Have Withheld, was published only last month in the UK by Canongate Gate Books. Our very special thanks go to Arts Council England, the British Council and Creative Scotland, without whom this event and the International Literature Showcase programme would not have been possible. Tonight's event is just one part of a really exciting week of writer showcases, new commissions and headline events. We really hope that you join us across the week to hear from some of the compelling writers and those at the forefront of best practice in the global literature sector. Full details of the events can be found at nationalcentreforwriting.org dot uk forward slash ILS. I really hope you enjoy the event. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Kai Miller. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. It was my pleasure over the last couple of months reading and sometimes rereading uh, some of the works of these writers as I tried to curate uh, these 10 writers who, according to the brief, were the exciting, unmissable new voices emerging in British literature and literature out of the UK. But I began to think of that word emerging in another way. I began to think about just the times that we're living through, uh, the times that we've made it through. And some of the anxiety and worry, apprehension, but excitement that we're facing as, as we see a new kind of world uh, take shape and emerge from just so many of the conflicts that we that we witnessed in the past year. And I began to think of the emerging writers as the writers who were beginning to think about that world, are beginning to shape it, beginning to write it. And these are some of those voices, some of the voices who are thinking about a new world, a new shape in some of the most insightful and inquisitive um, and just thoughtful um, ways of writing that I have certainly encountered in the past year. I'm sure you'll enjoy them and, and enjoy thinking with them in the way I have. So I'm going to tell you the 10 writers um, who I selected, and then we'll have a conversation with um, three of them who are gathered here tonight with you. First, we have Helen McClory, um, a kind of writer who I love to watch as she practices and stretches her craft, uh, just nimbly moving across genres. Um, McClory has written everything from flash fiction to um, short stories, uh, to her new novel, Beta Hall, which stretches across um, centuries, moving from the future into the past. Um, I always think that we need writers to show us new forms. Um, who are willing to brave it and McClory is establishing herself as a writer able to do just that. Michal McCann uh, moves in the tradition of Mark Doty and more recently Andrew McMillan writing the the queer body, the the male queer body, but the gay gaze is both central but absolutely incidental uh, in his work. This is, it, it is nothing to gawk over, it is it, it, it's not a part of a pathology. It's so effortlessly and seamlessly woven in. His, his way of seeing the world um, is a delight. Daisy Lafarge writes the poetry 
that this world in this moment needs. They're, these aren't so much hymns to the beauty of nature as they are dirges to what is fragile, a keening against sometimes literal toxicities that we live with and have grown dependent on. Um, Lafarge exploring a topic so heavy with so much grace and so much subtlety and so much insight marks her as a remarkable and a much needed poet. Rachel Long, who is here with us tonight, um, I thought that in a time when so many of our best poets still hold the reader a bit at arm's length, the open embrace of Rachel Long's poetry is refreshing. Her, her poems insist that all the things that make her, her black woman's sass and her political insights can be bent into careful craft rather than hidden in ellipses. And yet her poems are elliptical. There is always something, and I want to ask her about this, at the edge of them, a final beat withheld that the reader can only imagine and that haunts us. Gail McConnell, who is also here with us. I encountered Gail McConnell's work in her brilliant and wonderfully experimental collection on parenthood. And it was, I found the kind of work that teaches us, it certainly taught me how to ask questions I might never have thought to ask. Does parenthood always have to be gendered? Can a parental figure occupy a role that is neither father nor mother, but that encompasses our ideas of these, of these things? Um, her poems are formally playful as they try to invent a new language and a new possibility for people who resist sometimes the limiting construct of gender. Serish Hussein accomplishes in her debut novel, The Family Feat, something that is not an easy feat, to tell a story that is unapologetically domestic, a story about a very ordinary family living a very ordinary life, and she packs it with so much tension that I found I could hardly breathe as I read. I was biting my nails to see what happens next. Um, Hussein's saga is about a family that is not written about enough, a British Muslim family. And without throwing a single stereotype onto them, she allowed every reader to relate, literally, as if Amjad is our own gentle father, Sahil our own perfectly imperfect brother, and Zara, our very own selves. Stephen Lovat, uh, the year 2020, of course, plunged the world into one of the strangest and sometimes brutal experiences we would have in this world. And what was particular about this worldwide catastrophe is that it was itself so silent and that it also imposed silence. Lovat's beautiful meditation on birdsong is the first account I read uh, to take up residence in that silence and to begin to make sense of it. And what a beautiful direction he gives to say at this time, stop, listen to the birds. Ingrid Prasad's novel is near flawless, her storytelling compelling, but what really stands out in her novel is something more than its outstanding literary merits. It's her sense of compassion. It's not just that Prasad creates well-drawn and believe actors, but that she feels for them and draws us into that feeling. The great achievement of love after love is that it teaches us all over again how to love. Jared McGuinness uh, doesn't require his readers to walk a mile in his shoes. In fact, he doesn't want the reader to walk at all, but instead to navigate the world and its new strangeness from a wheelchair. Um, from the opening epigraph, McGuinness tells us that the line between memoir and fiction is about to be blurred. The blurred line is this novel's real accomplishment. The reader is never quite let off the hook and the story is weirdly charming, darkly funny and deeply human. In Caleb Azuma Nelson's novel, Open Water, we can forget the big black British novel, whatever that may be, Nelson has written for us a short novel and one that can be devoured in a single sitting. 
but that still manages to pack a big punch. It is the intelligence that infuses almost every keenly observed sentence that strikes you, and and not an intelligence that is sheer or bragging, but the kind of intelligence that holds within it a quality of vulnerability. Open water will enchant you even if it breaks your heart. Um, so I want to thank Caleb and Rachel and Gail for joining me um, for this conversation. Thank you guys, welcome. Thanks, lovely to be here. Thank you. Yeah, let me, let me start just, just openly. There's, as, so much is gonna get blamed on this year, sometimes unfairly. You know, COVID, is, COVID just has to shoulder the blame for a lot. Um, but you know, just the obvious question: how how have you been? How have you been dealing with it? How have you how have you been living through this past year and thinking through this past year? And if if at all possible, writing through this past year. It's. I feel like this past year has just been wholly a time of uncertainty, um, right. and for me, like writing has has proved the way of knowing that there is a certainty in my life. Um, so even if I'm like not directly writing fiction, which is my main thing, um, like being able to get to a page each day has been really reassuring um, because there's been some stability in that. And I've been able to say that this is, this is something that I know if I continue with won't disappear. Um, I won't lie, it's, it's been really hard. <laughs> it's been really difficult to, to maintain that in the, in the face of something that something enormous and what feels like this like big grief that hasn't ended yet. Yeah. That, yeah, that, thanks. I, I mean, I, I've, I've been particularly wondering about that, just, just because, I mean, certainly in, in Jamaica, where I'm from, the, like, funerals haven't, they've actually postponed funerals. So you, you, can, you can bury the dead, you just can't, you just can't hold a funeral. And, and of course, the, this was the, the law in so many places. And, and, and I've wondered about that, how we've, in this past year, we've lost the medics of grief. Like, you know, the, that it feels like there's this whole grief that we, that because we can't travel, because we can't hug, how do we begin to process, you know, this period? So that yeah, that 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 resonates. Um, what about you? What about you guys, Rachel and Gail? How have you been processing dealing with this year? Um, it has been very quiet, but um, I think for a long time was a quietness that I needed. Um, right. I, I enjoyed sitting in it for a while. Um, there was no writing that was happening or is still happening, but so much more reading, um, so much more time to think at, at length, you know, sort of an interrupted um, thought and so like less noise um i feel like i've been over this year sort of grief and what you said about funerals is really interesting as well the the yesterday was the first no the day before yesterday was the first day i went to a gallery and i just started crying like into my mask and, and oh, i no. yeah and i thought i've missed this so much and i didn't realize i had and what else made me well up as well? Um, it was the gallery. Something else made me cry, but something that was like super simple and something that we would otherwise have maybe done sort of every other Saturday or what, or, you yeah. know, quite regularly. And so there is, I realized that I, I, I am grieving and I just didn't really know that I was consciously. All right. That's how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 that's great. And for you, Gail. I was talking to some friends about this yesterday and we were saying, you know, some of us have really missed solitude during lockdown and some of us have really missed the company of friends. And the thing is, we've sort of had right. neither of them. 
things. Like those of us who are introverts have missed solitude and those of us who are extroverts have missed seeing people and yeah. nobody has gotten any of it. And so I think it's been hard for everybody in different ways. It's been interesting for us. I mean, so we had, we've been one of the families, I guess, who experienced the sort of collapse of childcare for about six months and um, our son Oh, right, because you have to stay in there. Yeah, and he, he just turned three recently, but um, he was a very different kid at the start of lockdown, you know, and was <laughs> breastfeeding, more of a baby. And so it was interesting because I, you know, I didn't choose to spend all the time with him that I ended up spending, but I'm now so grateful that I got to spend so much time with him mm. at such a young age. And, you know, it was really interesting. My partner and I had to work out the dynamics of full-time work plus childcare and the way that that brought about a different level of equality in our relationship, which hadn't been there before and working oh. through all of that and just the exhaustion of looking after a small person, but also how that kind of just keeps you going and maybe keep, keeps your yeah. gifts at bed for a little while because, just, you know, reading Megan Maul and watching Twirly Woos. So um, <laughs> it's just been intense, but um, I feel like we're still just kind of headlong in it, really. Yeah. yeah. And that makes me think about something that, and, and, and I will ask you questions individually, but, but it just struck me and that one of the qualities, that, and it, it's probably in, it's particularly to the three of you that are gathered here that I was trying to work out myself as I, as I read your works and, and just the thing that you're trying to navigate. I felt that in all, with all three of you, there is a quality that, how do I articulate it? It was, it was a recognition of a reality a, where religion isn't central, and and it wasn't quite a mourning for it, uh, but it was a simple recognition that it didn't hold the place that it might have held for or grandparents or parents, and yet there is still the striving for you might call it peace, you might call it the sacred. It just felt that there was this yearning for that. Um, and I, I, I guess now just thinking about this past year that just plunged us into this kind of quiet that was that's probably not a kind of religious or sacred quiet, but it, 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 it somehow resonated with that. And it, it just made me wonder how you guys yeah, let, let me leave it at that. Is, is, is that something that is in, that, that, you, that you all reckon with? Um, certainly, Rachel, in, in your case, I, I always feel that the references to religion always are tinged with a, the hint of a kind of trauma, um, you know, <laughs> that, that this is a thing that you wanted to escape. Um, so, so it didn't feel in any way peaceful, but, but there was always the reckoning with it. Um, mm. Um, yeah, that's yeah. really beautiful. I do. I do. I think I do feel like that. I feel like that um, uh, on a daily basis. And then, so it's probably a mistake where it comes out in the writing, um, uh, a sort of governing by um, the the religious background that I grew up in, but also a a deep fear of it, um, a resentment of it, uh, but then right. also sort of like that you've got a hook in you there's still a line that goes up or out or any direction that um yeah that there's some connection that can't quite be cut um however much yeah. you try i like that idea of yeah a hook in you rachel it's one of the things i like so much about your work is that you you know, your title is drawn from the Psalms and there's a real sense of reckoning with that religious past, which I think is quite unusual in contemporary poetry. And it's something I find myself doing in the book that I'm going to publish in September, where I revisit like charismatic, you know, worship and speaking in tongues and like flag waving and this stuff that was in my distant past, and which for a long time I felt, I think, such a sense of kind of shame about an awkwardness as someone moving away from orthodox belief but increasingly you know I look at it with such a smile and I 
I, I can understand the ways in which it was formative for me in, in all kinds of ways to do with the body and to do with language and to do with um, community and things. So I'm, I'm really struck, Kai, that you see that in my work because it's not something I think has come into father mother very much, but it's, but it is a part of my history that I think shapes how I think about language and form and all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, Caleb, I don't know. I haven't had the pleasure yet of reading your novel, but I'm interested to know yeah, whether that resonates for you and, and I've been looking forward to seeing what it means when I get to your novel. I think writing, I didn't actually quite realise until like after I'd written the novel, the, the sort of wrangling with, with faith and with my like religious upbringing that was taking place in most of the sentences. Um, mm -hmm. And I wrote a, I wrote an essay after, <laughs> I wrote an essay after it was like the first piece of writing that I did after writing Open Water, um, which was just like exclusively about grief, like grieving my grandmother and the relationship between myself and my parents and their relationship between their faith and the black church um, and what kind of effect that it's had on me and in terms of like the way that I see the world um and perhaps that was the that was like one of the first occasions that I acknowledged that I've been like really wrangling with that upbringing and trying to reckon with it and trying to understand how I could exchange that faith for something else um or perhaps work out how I could try and try and renegotiate that faith so I wasn't so focused on this like very like sacred religious sort of um sort of tension and sort of moments and and perhaps like shift it towards hope and this idea of like still going towards something that's more that is sacred and these like kind of like sublime moments like i think i was i recently moved into an artist studio like i'm in here at the moment um and I, as well as a writer, I'm a photographer, and I try and take self-portraits once a week. Um, and those are very like sacred and quiet moments for me. Those are very like, those are moments which like approach this, this idea of like the sublime, which I think like religion really shares. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's something I've been, I've been reckoning and wrangling with of late. Yeah, I, I mean, all, all of you, by the way, could have just spoke you, you could have been speaking about my own life uh and pro probably probably that was it that there was just this weird resonance in 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 your work I, I know when i moved away from religious one of the things that was that i had to come to terms with is, is that there's an experience that though I, I didn't believe in the big structure there was there was an experience in that kind of very pentagon um being, you know, and and and, and it, I can think of all the ways in which it's manufactured. You know, the choir is singing the song, just you know, three choruses too long, and it just gets mournful. And there's a weird quiet, and someone in church, but also on that that when someone you know prophesied in the midst of that. It was it, it was the feeling of understanding your vulnerability and having someone speak into that and affirm. And I've always yearned for that in 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 writing. That writing was always about seeking what is vulnerable and what is truthful, and speaking into that. And I think in, in a way, probably it was that all your works seem to strive for a place like that, which is how. how Probably an ex I don't believe in the dogma, but there was something at the heart of those experiences that felt true and that I want to be true in writing. And I almost felt that you guys were teaching me in, in each of your works how, just a different way, how to capture that kind of truth and that kind of vulnerability. Um, which is not a question, but thank you for that. For that yeah. Thank you. That's, uh, yeah, that's a really beautiful observation as well. And again, I do think, kind of like Caleb, like I don't know if I realised 
a lot of that until it was finished or close to being finished and I could read it back. But I love that just that you said that you're speaking into a truth, whatever truth is perhaps, and also it being transit, a transitory and perhaps ever expanding concept inside of you as well. So I have some questions for each of you. Um, and again, some of this can break out into a group discussion, but probably I will go through uh, probably from Rachel to Caleb to Gail. And I'll ask you first, um, just to read, I mean, we asked you to read some, to, to select a, a, a passage to read. And probably you can, uh, you know, yeah, share with us that passage. And then we can ask some questions and, you know, we'll go one from one to the other. If, if that order is okay with you guys, if not, you can, yeah. Mm -hmm. Steve. Steve was the black one. Mum must have bought him for us. We wouldn't have asked for him. He was ugly. Of course, he fancied Princess Barbie, but her blue sparklies were strictly for him. We'd make them have SEX. Surfboard chest against pert rock dress. Slap and click of plastic against plastic. We'd make Steve watch, dunk him in the bath to cry. Ken would beat Steve up for fun till past bedtime. We'd wake to find Steve sprawled on the daisy carpet, but naked. The beatings got worse. Slashes across rubber legs, face colored in all red. The beatings got more frequent, quickly before school, before mum sees under the table. It got so bad, even dad complained. His lawnmower was jammed. On closer inspection, a tiny pair of shorts, charred torso. Thanksgiving. As if by accident, I find my head washed up window side of his bed. After all that fucking look, the sky's still pinned up. His nose is longer with his eyes shut. This whole time I've been holding, squeezing, ringing, folding, bending, nodding, thank you God for giving me someone who makes me hold my breath. I will be so light upon his life, he won't realize he's kept me. I'll leave not a mark on his pillow, papers, knife, DVDs, or wine glass. What blessing. Only when he is sleeping can I breathe out so deep my ribs come up like a ship. Oh, thank you, Rachel. Yeah, Rachel, some of the questions that I kept on writing and erasing, I, I realized what, what my trouble was, that there is something about your poetry and just this beautiful collection, that, I mean, congrats on it. It was always catching my breath, and I think the questions that it naturally looked to, uh, it felt like it was too intrusive to ask. If you know what I mean, that, 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 the, the points felt so vulnerable, right? That, and I guess my question is, is, is my sense of that right? That, that so many of the poems, though it wasn't living in and, uh, how do I put it? it, it so much of them touched on trauma. Is, is, is really what I want to say. And that's what feels too personal because the, the, the poems weren't making a spectacle of it. And I just wondered about that touch, how to the trauma, but relish in it, not make it a spectacle. It simply was there and it was what haunted the poems and made them so deeply powerful. Uh, 
so that's my hesitation. That, that, that's why some of them, you know, I, 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 I felt I didn't want to explore the trauma, but it, it's, it was so, it was, it was, the, it was present. It was there. How do you do that? You know, how, it, what was the process of writing this, this book and dealing with things that seem so painful, even when they live on the edges of him? That doesn't seem like a fair question now that I hear myself asking it. I don't even know what the question is, but it, but it certainly my sense. <laughs> I, I, I think it's. I think it's fair. I think it's a. I think it's a good um, inquiry um, into. Yeah. Well, I can. I can try and answer. Yeah. Um. How to write it in the beginning? At least the way that I I found was that I I had to write it. Um, that it okay. was that I was sort of for for a long time before sort of writing this book. I was I was purposely not saying, and so the I was there was a place that I I didn't I didn't want to go, but then there was also and a sort of eating up of self but also the work that there is something that i'm not being honest with even on the page and so then then daring myself to do that and then realizing that once i'd written it down that it could be something else that it didn't have to just say um memory it didn't have to stay trauma it could transcend it could become something different and actually i think there's lots of power on the page of writing trauma because then you can once it's once it's on the page you can start playing with it you can set it in a different place you can make the self multiple different people you can look at it from different angles um even moving uh, the chronology of the <laughs> chronology of an event around and where you place it in a book right. can also be interesting. Um, yeah. I also think where you end, where where the poem begins and ends as well. Like I didn't want the, I didn't, I didn't want to. I didn't want the poem to dwell on it. I wanted to be able to get out as, as the writer. And so where I found with a lot of them that, that are significantly about sort of, yeah, childhood abuse, like allowing the poem to end in a place that I could leave and get out, but that the poem could continue, but I didn't have to follow it. Your, your endings in that regard are incredible. I mean, that is absolutely the power of those poems for me. They, they, they always got out at, I don't want to say the right moment, but it was always an interesting moment. And that's what, for the reader, felt like, oh my God, I, I have to continue imaginatively with where this is going. But the poem doesn't, and so the other, the, the other part of that is that it was, it was never self-indulgent, but the trauma was never spent. Which is it? It just it, it was just an interesting thing to read as as a black reader to to look at that trauma that isn't it 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 wasn't made spectacle, and I'm always interested in writers who know how to do that, um, and and you did it just constantly poem after poem, the exit was was just wonderfully judged. Um, again, more m more more comment question so i mean after after the just the success of this which i'm going to ask all all of you I, I know gail i know gail has a book coming out but what next for you and i know that that is a horrible question that we always get asked but but i really am curious what for you guys what what what, what is beginning to percolate for me for after this book um yeah i i find reviews i'd be really interested to yeah. see um 
you all think as well but i was really interested in the reviews um of the book and w one in particular um said that the women loom large and articulate and the men are mostly off stage and i thought well okay fair and good um i don't know if all the, yeah the women are large in it and not all of them are particularly articulate but um i i i i got an analysis sentiment of that and I was like okay fine but there was one man actually who I, I who I did perhaps um want to be maybe more on stage and and my father and so I started thinking maybe more about daughter thinking about fatherhood from the perspective of a daughter and specifically like a, being a black daughter of a white father and perhaps I think I'm thinking about that now yeah okay brilliant the one of just the small things that i ask you is well just to declare what a pleasure it is to curate you in something because i i think so much of your time you spend curating other people um and you you know you are one of these people make or or literary world so much healthier because you hold space and you create space and you make space for people um again thank you for that work uh, but yeah tell, tell me about your work with is it octavia octavia or octavia yeah. you've made to again just make space for black women and women of color um yeah uh, how how is that community and helping to build that community uh helps your own process as a writer M massively massively like uh, creating that space um i found octavia in 2015 so that was still kind of really early on like the book wasn't written um, and yeah. terrible versions of it were sort of being penned but not yeah it was really early on but having that space and inviting um the other brilliant women around me that um whose work i love and how um we could be together in a space um that did not have to be traumatic because the space was made exclusive in in that way that we didn't have to uh explain or uh yeah be be anything other than just ourselves with each other and how the writing can then really excel in that space how the thinking can excel in that space how the conversations um finding similarities uh across and all the nuances across even even black womanhood and and you know being a woman of color and how how very different all of those experiences are but also how similar some of them can be because what, what I don't want to so much because then you know it's it's the critic who is making assumptions, but certainly what it felt like reading uh, reading my darling from the lions is I assume that I felt the power audience that I think what I've been trying to articulate that this one set but what has never made a spectacle. It felt like the audience was was black women. The power of that in the work, the power that it wasn't it wasn't aimed at. That, that overhear something that I could I could overhear a poem that that could acknowledge its trauma but not obsess over it. Uh, could, could could say things with the knowledge that the audience understood what was happening afterwards. It just felt that a, a, a good deal of the power in so many of those poems is derived from how comfortably it sat in an audience that understood. That's why I began to wonder just about you know how much o o Octavia helped in that, because the, the poems seem powerful from that, from that kind of presence and that kind of knowledge and that kind of audience. Thank you, Claire. And yeah, I think so. I think even thinking of myself like being a mixed black woman as well like being in octavia um helped me to even recognize certain parts of my identity and how i identified um yeah like yeah. within myself 
and with the outside world so if if you do feel like that and i'm glad that you do that this is a sort of it is too and for in a, in a big way to black women then i do absolutely owe everything to the women of octavia for that for helping me uh, understand parts of myself within them and within that community yeah brilliant thank you rachel all right and unless caleb or gail has any have any questions i will move over to caleb now if you want to share um the bit of reading that you've selected and it wasn't that day or the day after but sometime after that you cried in your kitchen you were alone in the house and had been for a week headphones sending sound into the silence a tender croon stretched across drums designed to march you towards yourself in an easy rhythm the rapper confesses his pain and so you stop and ask yourself how are you feeling be honest man you're sweeping debris across the kitchen tiles reaching into the corners for far fung flex moving the brush in an easy rhythm you begin to confess your joy your pain your truth you dial for your mother but she is still far away wrestling with the grief of her mother's passing you want to tell her that you miss her mother to confess that you lost your god in the days your grandma lost her body and gained her spirit to tell her you couldn't face your own pain until now she would need you intact you think you end the call you initiated you dial for your father but you know he will not have the words he will hide behind the guise he will tell you to be a man he will tell you how much he hurts he will not tell you how much he hurts too even though you can hear the shiver and the timbre of his voice you decline the call you dial for your brother but he too carries the house of your father he will not have the words so you're in the kitchen and you're alone but this isolation is new something has come undone you are scared you don't know what to do this pain isn't new but it is unfamiliar like finding a tear in a piece of fabric you cry so hard you feel loose and limber and soft as a newborn you want to pull and push and mold yourself back together the headphones slip from your head as you slide to the floor loose and limber and soft you're wailing like a newborn you're alone you don't feel in rhythm there's nothing playing the music has stopped a break also known as a percussion break a slight pause where the music falls loose from its tightly wound rhythm you have been going and going and going and now you've decided to slow down to halt and confess you were scared you have been fearful of this spillage you have been worried of being torn you have been worried that you would not repair would not emerge intact you lost your god so you cannot even pray <clears throat> and anyway prayer is just confessing one's desire and it's not that you don't know what you want is that you don't know what to do about it you're on your knees and the music has stopped and you're wailing like a newborn your mother calls you decline the call she would need you intact and you were not so you need to face this alone you think something has come undone your cup has run if over and now it's empty the flow has ceased but you're still loose and limber and soft 
You want to push and pull and mold yourself back together. So you rise from the cool kitchen tar. You stumble from, hall, from kitchen to hallway, making it to your stairs. The well has dwindled, but you still feel tender. You gaze at the mirror on the wall and know the music has stopped and the rhythm has fallen away. You confess your joy, your pain, your truth. You stop and ask yourself, how are you feeling? Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned Baldwin a couple of times throughout the narrative. Uh, I was curious, have, have you read Elizabeth Alexander? I haven't, no. That's cute. Because I swear, Nesta, I am going to make this happen. I want to teach your book beside Alexander's The Black Interior. Mm -hmm. Because I am sure that it, it, it was one of the books where I felt certain that if if Alexander had read your book before, she would have written a whole other chapter. Uh, so specifically, go for it. Specifically, read her essay towards the black interior, and and then there's a whole book gathered around with the same title. Uh, but there is something about that that daring perspective that you choose for the the narrative the second person perspective like who they dares to write a book in second person like the audacity the absolute audacity of that but what it does is that it gets us into that interior i mean your book is is a book about black interiority which you so rarely see we, we see the external but you that perspective just takes us right in and it's so layered, it's so vulnerable, it's so intelligent. Uh, and yeah, I want to ask you questions about that, but Jesus, how did you decide on the second person? Like, <laughs> like just craft-wise, how, how did you decide to take that risk? I think I'd, I'd written a couple of very short essays in the second person before that were actually directly before writing Open Water that were mostly focused on photography and ways, the ways that we see each other, um, specifically looking at the ways that black people were seen and also the way that black people see each other. Um, and that was really that I remember thinking this is, this is the starting point, this place oh, yeah. where I'm thinking about making images and making images of black people that afford them a fullness and a wholeness that isn't afforded to us every day um right and in order to do that like i knew that i had to tap into the interior and actually tap into my own interior and yeah. in order to do that i knew i had to i knew i had to do something that meant that i could present I could present like the, like the most vulnerability. I had to really push the reader as far as possible into the narrative. And by using the second person, it meant that the reader becomes both an audience and also the protagonist themselves. Because if in your yeah. mind's voice, you're asking the question, how are you feeling? You're asking yourself that question as well as the protagonist asking themselves that yeah. question. Yeah, it was, it felt, it just, and I also, I think it was, it was also something where I was like, it, I was really trusting of my instinct. Like I remember writing the first like few pages and just like thinking this feels right. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it, it is one of the most striking things, but it was, there's the two things in concert that you, you chose that level of, again, interiority. You chose the perfect narrative access for it, and it was an interiority of a black male character. It was it, it was stunning. It's it's just so rarely done, and it, it was such access. You know, one of the things Alexander talks about in towards a black interiority 
is how it's so often when when we try to capture blackness uh again there's so much you know obsession with with a kind of white gaze but a kind of white colonial gaze that that was obsessed with black authenticity and black authenticity was never authentic right because it was it it, it was performing too much it 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 it, it couldn't be it couldn't be thoughtful it couldn't be intelligent it was it was everything was exterior about it and you know just one of the weird one of the weirdly wonderful things about your book is how authentic it is because it isn't obsessed with authenticity you know it it, it could be as complex as it as it could be it, it could be black simply because it was black it it, it didn't have to perform blackness um I really enjoyed that. Uh, Thank you. You, you. There are two genres that you mentioned that I wanted to ask you about. Let me first ask you about the essays, uh, because oftentimes you've been talking about how these, the story came out of essays, which excited the hell out of me, right? I, I just feel we need more essayists and more, more people who are writing nonfiction. Uh, Will you go back to those? Will you go back to the essay as a form or to nonfiction as a form? Might that form part of your future writing projects? I mean, just just might it. I'm not saying that you're doing it right now, but because I would be so excited about voice writing. Yeah, nonfiction. I mean, I hope, I hope so. I feel like so much of like I'm I'm working on something new at the moment and so much of the, the process of working in fiction involves me writing a lot of non-fiction so like a lot of kind okay. of like it's really i spend a lot of time like i feel like a lot of time just like kind of sitting with ideas like i really liked what rachel said earlier about this time where you've been able to like sit with a thought and like let that time stretch where you're sitting with a thought and not just kind of like move on to something something else i often spend a lot of like a, a lot of writing time like working through the same idea again and again and again um, and i feel like with with open water the culmination of a lot of different ideas that i had been having or wanting to explore but it also felt like the start of that exploration as opposed to right. the answer to your questions um yeah yeah but i think that with with regards to me writing non-fiction i feel like because of the different art forms that i that i straddle like the the essay is like such a like a right place for me to explore different things that i'm interested in and different mm -hmm. things i'm feeling. so caleb i imagine that lots of people ask you about just the interplay between photography and and writing uh just how much yeah, how much they play onto each other or into each other i i'm not so much I, I i was curious not so much if photography leads into your writing practice but how much writing informs your practice as a photographer if at all i think before, so before writing open water like the two my two practices were just like very I didn't have an understanding of how like closely linked they were and how synergetic right. that that sort of relationship was. I think when I make images, it's something very instinctive. Um, I shoot on film, so like I shoot on like an old like medium format camera, and so it's a very slow process and often feels like I'm writing something. Um, okay. Just because it will be like in order to shoot. 10 frames it will take the better part of two or three hours um wow and that, that's like a very kind of like yeah just like a slow and laborious but really reward rewarding sort of process um but it's like i said it's really instinctive and it's very much like i when i'm holding a camera like i understand most of the time the feeling that i'm trying to communicate both of myself and the person on the other side of the lens I think where writing has really has really helped me make images is in like reinforcing the way that I see the world. Um, mm -hmm. 
by like by like I spend a lot of time kind of just like writing what I can see around me, like very small everyday things, because those are the things that are most interesting to me. These kind of quotidian moments, um, and I'm often asking myself with writing, like, how do you feel, and what am I feeling? Um, yeah. Whereas previously, I would have asked myself, like, what are you thinking? I've tried to like strip strip that away and really get to the crux of, mm. of the emotions and the feelings that I'm trying to express. And it means when I come back to this process of making images, it's like that there's more of a trust there in what I am feeling because I'm, I'm asking myself that question so often. Yeah. I also love that photography just literally means, you know, the writing of light. And so, you know, already from the word, you know, we, we have this kind of connection. Uh, Thank you, thank you so much, Caleb. Uh, and Gail, coming over to you, can you bless us with uh, your selection? I'll do my best. I'm going to read a couple of poems from Father Mother, which is this um, pamphlet of poems exploring queer parented and seahorses and other things. Um, I'll read something called Untitled Villanelle, and the repeating lines in the Villanelle are drawn from two American fiction writers. Uh, they're epigraphs of the poems. I'll read, I'll read the epigraphs and then I'll read the poem. Untitled Villanelle. I have often longed to see my mother in the doorway, Grace Haley, because having a father made me want a father, Sandra Newman. I have often longed to see my mother tap dance in a top hat like she did before he died. Having had a father made me want a father. A mother, madder, mether is a measure that keeps its shape and holds what's stored inside. I often see my mother. Mistype the word, it stretches to a father. Cartload carries fodder hitched outside. A father made me. You come to know the one against the other. You measure till the meanings coincide. I have often longed to see my father. My mother's mother died before her daughter was a mother. Alone, she gave me all she could provide. Not having a father made me want to be. Father, what am I to you, mother, father, neither, like cells named split and double, unified? I have often longed to mother, mother, father, father, mother, mother, father, other mother. An apple seed. Apple, cup, and shell. I say these things to you. I read them from the book. Book, book, this is a book. You roll yourself to where the sound must be. To sound, to word, to thing, to me, the mouth that sounds out shell. Come out shell. The shell comes out and curls itself around the air again. The thing itself is waves of sound. For sound, it is a swimming, moving to and fro, vibrating shell, the peel and rind, creaturely home upon a time. Space time is soft bodied, Einstein said, the mollusk. We are in a constant flux, the quantum world, stretching, twisting, curving your small body to my own hands against my lips, your fingers on my tongue. What is that sound? What currency is this? What vessel for existing shell? When you were still in shell, we counted you in days. Two cells on day one, four the second day, six the third, when you were placed inside another room to make your way, an apple seed, a blueberry, an ear of corn, a coconut, 
The day of shelling came and went, till two weeks on you flexed. We were two souls, something like scales, something like shells were falling from our eyes. As out you came, you come out with a cry just like the ah of apple. Thank you, I'm go. Stop there. Thank you. <laughs> That's so beautifully read. Thank you, Gail. Yeah. What what struck me about that reading and, and about the poems, but the reading demonstrates it so so obviously and beautifully. It's so playful. Your Father Mother is such a playful book. Uh, yeah, I mean what is, what is your practice like? Because part of your job is, you know, that is is literary critic, uh, and you know, you you're you know PhD lecturer, and and there is, and here is this heavy, or a seemingly heavy topic about gender and parenthood, but it's so playful, so wonderfully playful. How how do you juggle between those modes? I mean, maybe one drives me to the other in that, you know, I think I've been trying to unlearn the practices of literary criticism in certain ways. And I think you have to to try to write poetry. You're in, you know, you enter a totally different sphere. But it's so interesting becoming a parent because you learn that, you know, play is a baby and a child's learning and work. And it's also the yeah. way through which attachments are made. So, you know, Finn is teaching me constantly about the value of play and what play does and you know I was reading lots of people like Donald Winnicott and who's you know all about the language of play and word play is a fun thing you know I think play often stops you from getting stuck as a writer like to play I played a lot with anagrams even playing with something like sonnet form or villanelle where you have this kind of crossword puzzle like you set for yourself of you know you know the, the kind of traditions of form that you have to work within and beyond I think as long as it's playful um, there can be kind of energy in the work, but I think play can also lead you into a different kind of vulnerability and truthfulness too. I mean, when I was writing that Villanelle, the line that surprised me most was the line, I have often longed to mother, which I never would have written if I hadn't, if I didn't have to work within the refrains and I had a limited amount of things I could do. I could erase parts of them or I could change words slightly, but I had to stay within those uh, refrains. and. It was really interesting how that, you know, playing in that form kind of brought me to a place where I could assert something that I didn't even know was true. So hopefully, play forced into, into it. By, I mean, forced I into it by the form. Yeah. Wow. Um, it can surprise you, I think. Hopefully, play leads you into new discoveries about yourself and about the world. But yeah, as I say, like, I think my toddler is my teacher in these matters. <laughs> Yeah, no, a, a beautiful teacher. Uh, tell me about, because it seems to me, just from reading, that uh, there is a moment in that Villanelle that actually sets us up for what is upcoming collection, right? Uh, just because it, it mentions that loss, the, and, you know, it's that, the, the loss of the father figure in, in your own life, that I gather becomes more central in this in this upcoming book? Yeah, that's right. So I have a book coming out with Panned in the Margins in September called The Sun is Open. And I suppose really it's a it's a sequence or a book length poem in a way. And the poems are right. they don't have titles and they're written as these kind of narrow blocks of text on the page. And the central event around which the poems kind of swirl is my father's murder. He was shot and killed outside our home when I was three and a half. And so there's a way in which that event um, puts me in contact with Irish history, with colonial history, plantation history, terrorism, the troubles, violence, class, all kinds of things um, that I didn't really understand at the time, but which have left a really profound imprint on my life. And in some ways, my life's work since that event has been trying to absorb it and come to terms with it one way or another and to go back to our earlier conversation I suppose religion has played quite a central part in that too so right. two things are intertwined in this book so it's um it's an, been a really interesting book sort of just to edit and work on um because it's 
uh, it's, a, it's a whole piece, I suppose. So it's, it doesn't include anything that I've published um, previously. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what people make of it really, but it's been a real joy to work on. And what I wanted to do, I mean, I'd written about my father's death before in a long poem called Typeface, but I, I felt that that was a poem that had a lot of anger and irony in the way that it approached this event. And I wanted to write more about the language and texture of childhood. I wanted there to be joy. I wanted there to be these church experiences and banana man and, um, yeah. 1980s culture and also this event and to kind of make it a more panoramic view of everything and to make it more expansive. So that's what I hope this yeah. new book will be. Where did this happen, by the way? Sorry. I mean, where did your father? It was in our, the front garden of our home in Belfast. Both Caleb and Rachel have used the word trauma, I think. And I think everybody's, you find ways through writing to deal one way or another with things that have been you know, that, that feel like they're beyond language, I suppose. And then you find language to try to, you know, give shape and form yeah. to that experience at a distance of a sort. So that's the gift of it, I suppose. I mean, I have to say, I am, I'm really looking forward to, to the pen in the margin book, uh, but it's, it's just, it strikes me how you're beginning to, to, to come up with this work that that all feels like pieces of the same puzzle. Like, like, like I love how already your work is like, like the themes of parenthood, the theme of, of the father figure, um, even as, even as you interrogate those and you, and, and, and you separate them from gender, but they, they keep on, it, 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 it's like you're, you're one of these writers who you have your own planetary system and your poems you know they just begin to pinpoint parts of a very specific world and it's exciting and it's playful and um yeah i am really looking forward thank you thank you i'm really encouraged yeah. by that you know i think it's funny when you become a parent because there's a weird way in which you become the child that you were, and you also become kind of the parents that you had. And there's all these kind of doublings and triplings, and it's just a sort of like paper dolls out over time. So there's something for me about trying to explore all that multiplicity of cells and of relations and of planetary <laughs> networks, maybe, that in some ways is all around a very small orbit, but I'm, I'm interested in it, you know, like I, I was approaching the age that my my father was when he was killed you know he was killed when he was 35 and so it was around that age i really started to yeah write about that experience because i had this strange sense of i'm always going to be older than he was and then like similarly you know my son is going to be three and a half soon which is the age i was when my father was killed so there's a weird way that time is yeah. you know, doubling back on itself so i'm, I'm sort of interested in that yeah 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 well thank you and i i know that the more people who are introduced to your to your work through this um, through this project uh, through all to, to all of your work that that work will bring joy and pleasure and insight as it has for me. Um, so so thank you once again and uh, to everyone watching. I mean check out check out these books. They are they are worth checking out. They are they are rich. They are insightful and. They're playful. These these are good writers who know what they're doing. Um, yeah, this is the Britain that we want to emerge. These writers are writing it. <laughs> <laughs>